welcome to music podcast rewinding from montenegro how are you i'm great thank you for having me on yeah you you come straight from the studio you uh, going to or you record just a uh, uh, second album this year if i'm if i'm not wrong yeah it's not a full length album but it's pretty close it's uh, the the length of it is 20 minutes and 20 seconds because uh, it's called 2020 for the year that we're in right now this year of madness and uh, it just happened that the length of it is it wound up being uh, 20 minutes and 14 seconds so i just added another six seconds and it was perfect it became 2020 yeah you are much inspired in this situation with corona and quarantine yeah absolutely i mean i've had nothing but time on my hands and uh you know if you have a creative mind you know, that's an uh, opportunity you know yeah i i read your book and uh, after it first thought was how this man is still alive and in other hand how he hasn't killed somebody in that uh, life journey so uh, can you tell me when you uh, finished the book uh, what was your feeling was it relief was it uh, uh, are you were you sad were you happy well it was kind of a relief just to finally get it off my I, uh, my, my chest or my off plate, you know, it took a long time to write, but, um, you know, uh, I really didn't think about it much when I was doing it. Um, I was just kind of spilling my guts, but, uh, you know, in hindsight now that, uh, that it's been out for a while, um, yeah. it, it was, a uh, it was a good thing to do. You know, it, it, um, it caused me to re-examine my life a little bit and uh, think about where I am now. And, um, you know, I'm very grateful. Yeah. It's a little harder when, when you have kids and that fear that they might be uh, know something that they shouldn't. Yeah, well, the thing is... Uh, my kids you know they know my past, they know my history pretty much uh, as much as they care. You know, um, yeah. I don't think too many kids really care so much about the details of their parents' lives before yeah. they were born. You know, but um, but you know, as as a father, it's uh, you know, I think about all the stuff I went through. You know, I, I of course I'm always concerned about the. Yeah. the not just my kids, but but just about you know young people in general and, and the type of you know situations that are out there in the world and and the the, the opportunity for making bad decisions is so it's everywhere you know so I feel you know it's partially my obligation I think it's obligation for all all survivors all all adults uh, to um, try to uh, you know share that you, what knowledge we've acquired and, and maybe save some people some of the some of the mistakes that we may have made yeah. right and also in book you gave us another perspective of uh, old New York uh, uh, from today's point of view what's the main differences when you were young and when the scene started and today? Um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot more money in the city now than there was back then. Um, there's also a lot more people. Uh, I think those are probably the two biggest differences in how the city has evolved. Um, but, you know, in a lot of ways, it's actually sort of starting to regress back to the old ways because, um, you know, Especially with all the things that have been happening this year, you know, there's uh, yeah. there's a certain level of intensity that I haven't felt in a long time, and also uh, there's also a lot less police presence now. Um, after all the, the the 
protests and the riots and everything else that have been happening all over the country, I think law enforcement has kind of backed off a little bit. And, uh, you know, some people think that's a, you know, that's great, that's awesome. But you know what? I remember what this city was like back in the old days when there was zero police presence, you know, back when the police was completely corrupt and, and pretty much the city was run by mafia and gangs and stuff like that. And um, honestly, I don't want to see it go back to that. You know, I, I, I don't want to see it go back to that. I think the people who want to see, you know, want to defund and dis disband the police and this and that, uh, there are people who haven't really experienced what it's like to live in a gang controlled environment, an environment where every time you walk down the street, you have to wonder if you're going to get robbed or jumped or maybe just shot for fun. You know, I mean, I remember people getting, killed just, you know, because kids were bored, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, shit like that scares me when I have my teenage sons running around out there and they're, you know, one of my boys is all wrapped up in all the gang bullshit too. You know I mean? This is like, this is life, you know, teenagers, you know, are going to do what they're going to do. They're going to, roll with the type of crowds they're going to roll with and they're going to, you know, they're going to try to find their manhood in, in whatever way they think is the appropriate way. And, and in the streets, it's usually not a good way, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I love them to death and I always try to talk to him. I'm always trying to give him whatever advice I can. But of course, at the end of the day, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. Young people are going to make bad decisions as well as some good ones you know right and also uh, when you mention gangs and uh, life on the street you gave us also in book uh, a perspective of racism that you felt in your neighborhood uh, we saw today as you also mentioned today uh, uh, riots and and stuff that's going with it uh, in the in that terms yeah. what 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 does it uh, uh, change since your time? Well, I think, well, first of all, racism has always been there, you know, on some level or another. Right. You know, it's, it's an inf unfortunate reality, you know, people judge each other for the wrong reasons. Um, but I think in the old days, it was more, I don't want to say more normal, but it was almost more socially acceptable on all sides, you know, like, and, and back then you could almost laugh at it at the same time because you knew it was reality, but it was also, for instance, I'll give an example. When I was young, we had TV shows like Sanford and Son and, um, uh, and uh, what was uh, All in the Family with the with Archie Bunker? Okay, these were shows that were. It was all, Archie Bunker was always saying very racist shit and very politically incorrect and inappropriate type of shit, and he just was speaking as as a you know as your average middle class you know parent from Queens, an older guy, and it was funny. And knew he was saying a lot of really stupid, ignorant shit, but it was funny and you could laugh at it. It was the same thing with the show Sanford and Son, Red Fox. He was always saying really fucked up shit, but it was funny and you could laugh at it. And, you know, so back then you, there was an understanding of this is reality, but at the same time, you could kind of laugh at each other. And, and you, I mean, I always had friends of every ethnicity, you know, black, Hispanic, Chinese, you know, you name it. it. I went to school with all different races of kids and we all got along, but it was there. 
You know, it, racism was there. And, you know, but back then you could fuck with each other. You, you Chinese motherfucker, you would say that to your friend. You know, like, it, it, yeah. it, you know, you, you black fucking, you, you know, you, you could, you could really, you could make fun of each other and, and still be friends. You know, right. now it's, it's way more touchy. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, if you say something that's inappropriate, oh my God, you know, it's like a fucking major, major People have become way. There's a difference between becoming more sensitive and becoming too sensitive. Yeah. You know, I think people people have to be sensitive to each other. People have to be respectful to each other. But at the same time, when you get so um, almost insecure or defensive about things, mm-hmm. then uh, you know. It, starts to get ridiculous you know it starts to get really ridiculous and and i think that you know what's happening in this country right now um it's fucked up but i think it it gives us uh it puts a spotlight on a problem that has been here for a long time yeah you know and it seems that media has great Uh, and police brutality also it's mixed up all that stuff Well, you know, police, you know what, there, there's always been an issue as far as institutionalized racism. Mm-hmm. You know, people, some people, a lot of white people especially like to think that that doesn't exist. Well, of course it exists. Yes, it does. It's, it's, it's been in our culture mm-hmm. for fucking ever. Yeah. So, you know all the fucked up things that are happening right now, God willing, yeah. it's going to put a spotlight on the problems that people can start to address this, can start to look in themselves, can start to look at each other. But, um, but sadly, I think uh, more people are actually taking sides and 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 digging in and and um, expressing their anger rather than uh, looking for solutions. Right. And, um, so you know, it's really crazy, man. It's a crazy time. You know, it's a crazy time in this country, and um, I, I hope that it's sometimes you know, change is painful, and sometimes. Uh, you have to, you know, to extract, a, you know, poison, it sometimes hurts. You know, it's kind of like having a boil that you have to, it's not, you know, it hurts. But after the poison is gone, the infection can go away, you know. Right. Hopefully we're at this point in history. I, I don't think we are. I think, I think it's just a bad shit, you know. And <laughs> I don't think we have too much hope. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, I got to mention, uh, my feeling is that you were moved away from New York hardcore scene today. Uh, music is also changing. How you see the de- development of music today? Um, as far as New York hardcore goes, I, I honestly don't know yeah. any about it at this point in time. I... I haven't really been a part of the New York hardcore scene in uh-huh. the late 80s. You know, uh, the only reason I'm still connected to it is because I kind of, you know, I wrote the book. I kind of, you know, I created the, 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 this, this scene in New York. You know, I was one of the, the founding people that caused it to happen. So mm-hmm. you can't really separate me from it. It's kind of like, you know, It's impossible. It's like, you know, Johnny, Johnny Lydon, Johnny Rotten, you know, he'll always have been in the Sex Pistols. He'll always be connected to punk rock, even if he's now, you know, a yeah. Trump supporter and even this, that, the other. You know, no matter how much all these new school punk rockers want to hate him, they can hate him all the fuck they want. Yeah. The fact is, is Sex Pistol changed every fucking thing. And there's not a punk rocker alive who doesn't owe their whole 
fucking genre of music right. to the Sex Pistols, you know, as well as the Ramones and other bands. But you can't take away, you take him out of the equation. So in that same way, you'll never be able to take me out of the hardcore equation. You know, it's just, you know, even if I never played another hardcore song in my life, playing classical music or jazz, and I'd still be part of New York hardcore just by my, you know, that shit, that shit is my blood. My blood, New York hardcore. Like you fucking, that's what came out of my fucking body, you know? And, and if you created that scene, uh, who do you think that changed it? Is there some person, uh, some band who changed it? I don't think there's, I don't think there's, I don't think there's any one person that caused it to mutate into what it did. I think what destroyed it in New York was all the gangs when, um, you know, honestly, I think things like DMS and all that type of bullshit is what made me lose interest in the hardcore scene. And, and, and to be honest, those guys were all fucking late cars. You know, most of them, those kids didn't even know about hardcore until like the mid 80s or, or late 80s. The guys who really fucked the scene up, in my opinion, didn't even get into the scene until the very late 80s. You know, these are the assholes who start going to CBGBs and, and going on the dance floor with hammers and shit like that and, and sneak hitting people, you know. These are the ass and these are people that everybody thinks are cool. You know, all these MS ass. I don't think that shit's cool. I don't think there's anything cool about that at all. These are the same assholes that started bringing guns to CBGB just to like show off. I don't think that shit's cool. When the fuck did you ever need a gun at a hardcore show? Yeah. All right. Like I used to carry guns when I was young, but that's because I lived in a fucked up neighborhood and I was involved with a lot of drugs and a lot of crime and shit like that. But I was not going to hardcore shows with the intention of bullying other hardcore kids. Yeah. You no, know, I wouldn't go to a show and be like, Yeah, what crew are you with? You know, that was never my fucking way of thinking. I always felt that the hardcore community was a worldwide thing, like You know, no matter what your personal values or ideas were, I always felt that there was the hardcore world and then there was the rest of the world. And if you were part of my world, I didn't give a fuck about, you know, it didn't matter what race, what color, what politics or whatever. We were all part of the same culture, the same subculture. Right. And, uh, and I just feel like, you know, New York used to be a tougher city when I was a kid. So we all used to kind of stick together. We really didn't have much choice. Yeah. And um, as, we, as New York became a softer city, the, the scene started to fight within itself because it's like, I guess they got bored, you know, or I guess they didn't have enemies out there that were trying to fuck up punk rockers and hardcore kids anymore. Hmm. So they... Started fucking themselves up. I don't, I don't. I think they're a bunch of fucking ignorant fuckwits. I really don't like the MS or any of that bullshit. They, they, uh, you know, they encourage, right. you know, drug. Dealing. They encourage being bullies. I don't like people who use intimidation to fuck with other people. I think it's cowardly. I think people that are really tough, they're getting paid to fight. They're in, they're in cages fighting for money, or they're, you know, fighting terrorism or they're fucking doing something they're actually fighting an enemy they're not randomly targeting people that are weaker than them and so fuck those people yeah and when we mentioned john lyden uh, you met uh, in your career great people and great artists like uh, the clash bob dylan and uh, bowie and uh, all these figures who done and john lyden yeah so much for the music Uh, for for many people, you are a hero in music today. Uh, how you feel from that uh, perspective, from that role? Uh, what what you think that people expect from you musically and uh, like to bring some wise to them? Well, I hope that people are gonna get to a place with me where they never know what to expect, because. Um, For instance, with last record, I had the instrumental with cellos and stuff. I don't think anybody expected that, but a lot of people liked it. I wasn't sure 
what the response was going to be, but I had to do it for myself to satisfy my creativity. I also have a, a, a song on this next record that's very, I don't know if I would say experimental, but very different. It's another uh, instrumental, and it's more of a, of a fusion type of funk type, jazz fusion type of, but very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it really exhibits Rocky's playing, um, which is really cool. Because, you know, he's so much more than a hardcore guy. He's just such a great musician. So, you know, uh, so I like to, to create an atmosphere where musicians can play and have fun without the limitations of a genre or a style. So although my music, you know, I'm always going to be writing through the lens of a, of a hardcore perspective, but I'm always going to try to bring in elements of other styles of music because that's what makes music interesting. That's why the first Cro-Mags album was what it was, because I was using things that I discovered in other realms of music. I mean, the, the intro we got to know is, is definitely more of a, of a fusion type jazz intro than it is anything to do with hardcore. But now that's considered uh, a standard in hardcore. Yeah. When I wrote that shit, it was not. So, so that's my whole point is, you know, always try to up the game, always try to be something interesting, always try to experiment a little bit, you know, otherwise this shit just turns into repetitive bullshit, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm mean, sure, you know, bands like Sick of It All, you know, people like them and that's fine. But it's to me, all the fucking records sound the same. And not only that, they all sound like negative approach. So... <laughs> You know, I mean, they're a great band. They put on a great show. But I'm just being honest here. Yeah. You know. And and how you feel today? Uh, I don't know. In history of music, uh, the album that's made like Age of Coral. Uh, when I read it, I, I couldn't believe how fast and how good we see today that become the cult album. Uh, what's your feeling today about that? I know you you said that. Uh, that album should uh, sound better and, and more powerful than that is. Well, I didn't like the production. I never liked the way it came out. And, um, but, um, you know, obviously it had a, a, a big impact. So, I mean, there must be something good about it, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm, I, to me, it's an honor, you know, that, that, that I've played a part of history or that, uh, That my music, you know, that it's been a part of so many people's lives. That's uh, the greatest honor for me as a, as a as a humble musician. You know, somebody who came from the streets, who came from poverty, and the fact that my music that I created managed to get all over the world and and managed to you know influence a lot of people. That's a uh, it's pretty mind boggling. You know, that was never my intention, and and. Uh, you know it, it, i'm it's an honor i'm i'm a little shocked still yeah. you know it, it's getting more popular than than ever i think you know it's it's true and it's it's pretty crazy you know i mean you know as history moves on you know i mean you know someday may, maybe people will consider me like you know the lemmy of hardcore or some shit you know i think they already do that <laughs> Uh, you know what? I'll take it, man. Because yeah, if there's anybody you know that I respect, it's that motherfucker. <laughs> But great, great stories when you met uh, on the street, uh, Jaco Pastorius. Oh God, what a mess! <laughs> <laughs> Incredible musician, a, a tragedy of human, uh, unfortunately, you know. But a beautiful soul, you know. Right. Right. And and for the end, I gotta ask you, uh, because I'm not familiar too much about uh, what is that uh, uh, in early years and even today, people are get along with the uh, Hare Krishna movement. Uh, can you explain mm -hmm. me that phenomena in hardcore world? Well, for me, you know what? I... I uh, you have to understand the life that I was living at the time and 
uh, a teenager and you're seeing just like you you see death, you see chaos, you see destruction. You know, from, in my case, I was living in burnt out buildings and yeah. you know stealing to, to eat, and, and uh, you know how almost meaningless life is. Mm. You know, you know how cheap it is. You could be alive one second and dead next second. And and I think that um, I needed something to fill in the gap. I needed something to give me some sort of hope. I needed something that would give me some strength, something that maybe I couldn't see or touch, something, something spiritual. And quite honestly, I think, you know, it could have been anything. I could have. You know, it could have been Buddhism. It could have been, you know, whatever. Who knows? Just happened to come in contact with that particular time, and and it was uh, very, very meaningful to my evolution as a person. But um, say you know, I'm I'm not a hard Krishna. I'm, I I don't actually really. I'm probably more of an agnostic than anything else because I really don't know what comes on the other side of death. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend to have these answers because I think anybody who, who who tries to tell you this is what's happening after you die, I think they're full of shit because yeah. if you're still alive, you can't tell me. Yeah. You know, and, and honestly, I'm not a fan of, of uh, Krishna. The consciousness or of religion for that matter, because I think all religions are more or less political organizations that are designed to you know, manipulate the masses and to to milk money off of people and to to be in power. Uh, you know, I think that they're you know sexist and racist organizations, and and, um, and you know, India has a caste system, and, yeah. and how can I? How, how can I even in any way, shape, or form support something that has a caste system? That's the closest thing that we have in modern day society to, you know, fascism. Like it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a, it's an oppressive culture. You know, it's like, if you're born darker, you're never going to amount to anything. If you're born a woman, you're always going to be less than a man. If you're, you know, it, how can I, in, my, in, in, in a, with a clear conscience or with any sort of intelligence, how the fuck can I support that? Yeah. So, you know, it was meaningful. It is meaningful. I think that there's beautiful messages in scripture. I think there's a lot of important wisdom and, and it's very metaphoric. If you can understand the, the battlefield of Kukur, et cetera, and the situation that Arjuna was in when he was, when Krishna was revealing himself to him, if you can put your head in, into that whole story and understand what it really means, it's powerful. It's really powerful. Here's a man on the battlefield yeah. facing his enemies and facing his family members. He needs to go to war against people that are his blood. Mm. This is the most intense moment in his life. And all of a sudden, God is revealing himself, saying, this is what has to happen. Pow, this is a really intense, epic story that you can really get a, a lot of, of strength from. Yeah. But as far as uh, religion and all that shit, I'm, I'm really not into anything that's sexist or racist or, or, or about oppressing others. And that's really what religion's all about, in my opinion. Right. And that's it, Harley, for this time. Thank you very much uh, for your time. All best to you and your family. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your time as well, my friend. And, and I hope one day to, to visit Montenegro. I have some friends from there. Yeah. Uh, some of my students, my jiu-jitsu students were from there. And uh, I'm very close with their family. And, uh, so maybe one day yeah. I'll get to visit. It, it would be great to come to play and to... to show us jiu-jitsu it would be a, a honor and i hope that the opportunity presents itself yeah thank you very much cheers thank you my friend you take bye, care bye. have a great day thank you ciao thank you.